Um, it's an honor to speak uh, after Chris and Robert, who've both been a uh, big influence on my work. I'm, uh, I studied architecture originally. I work uh, at Foster and Partners, and also I develop a software uh, called Kangaroo, which is a form-finding software. So I'm going to talk about minimization and its role in the design process, and uh, particularly in the early design process. And I'm going to begin by talking about an experience I had uh, as a design student. And I, I enjoyed making things out of paper. And I was making these paper octahedra, where you can take six sheets of paper and interlock them to make an octahedra. And then I was experimenting with these by hand and started to join them into these larger systems, so assembling this into a larger polyhedral system. And this was around the time also that I was introduced to 3D modeling in the computer. So of course, I started to try and replicate some of these things in the computer. So starting from one octahedron, joining them around, uh, obviously much quicker in the computer with copy and paste. Uh, but then I found something. Actually, I was joining them, and I got around, and they didn't quite match up. And I was really confused. And I checked, and I double checked. And I thought I'd done something wrong the, in the computer. But eventually, I, I realized that this is, this is actually a property of octahedra. This is really what happens. You have uh, five regular octahedra, and they almost meet. Um, and in the physical model, I'd been missing this because there was an in inexactitude. There was a bit of flexibility and give in the paper. And the, the thing this really impressed on me is that, um, well, first of all, geometry can be really surprising, and that there are things uh, it can shock you. It's not always what you expect. And also, it really um, turned me on to the power of the computer for discovering and exploring these things. Um, so another thing still in the world of paper, another thing as I was exploring by hand was origami and these corrugation patterns. And so this is completely without computer, starting from uh, regular 2D tiling patterns and folding them into these corrugations that you can then actually twist, and they can take on these doubly curved shapes. And this was a completely different story when I tried to get it into the computer. And I completely failed at first, because uh, it's a very complicated system of constraints and actually relies on flexibility of the paper again. Um, so there were some things that I found much easier to do in physical models than in the digital world. Um, Chris already talked a bit about form finding and this idea of using physical models to find shapes um, which, due to the actions of physical forces on the model, you find a form which is best suited for resisting physical forces in a different configuration, so from a hanging model to something acting in pure compression or the soap film models of Friotto, where you use the ability of soap film to find a minimal surface, which you can then use in uh, the design of a tensile structure to make sure that the fabric is all evenly tensioned. Um, so Kangaroo is a project which was really inspired by trying to combine these two things, so the speed and exactness and flexibility that you have in the computer to explore geometrical ideas but then also trying to bring that together with some of the physical form finding. Um, and this works within the world of rhino and grasshopper. So probably familiar to all the architects here, but uh, if not, um, rhino is a 3D modeling program, and grasshopper um, is a, a parametric modeling environment that lets you very quickly wire together different components that create geometry. And uh, as Robert talked about earlier, you, this has an advantage that you can change the design. So you build a full system, and you can change the design later on and have everything update without having to redraw every arch or so on. Um, so in this system, uh, so I made software and uh, released it, and people started using it. So now I'm going to show a few different projects of things people have done with Kangaroo. Um, Initially, a lot of it was exactly about these kind of catenary models by Gaudi, so people building lots of pavilions. Uh, this one by Matsis, um, based on and another one uh, by the same group, uh, based on this idea of hanging structures and people using this to fabricate structures. And really, uh, 
my aim in these tools was to make them very uh, intuitive and easy to use. So these are, it's important to note that these are designers, not engineers using them. The, the idea was that it should be usable really early on in the design process without necessarily requiring a lot of technical knowledge. Um, uh, some examples of tensile structures, and I'll talk uh, more in my, my later talk about uh, minimal surfaces, which this actually, uh, despite the title, is, is not actually a minimal surface, and it's only possible because it uh, diverges a bit from a minimal surface. Um, some more tensile structures. So these are all, the thing that unites these different designs is that the the form is intimately tied to the force, which is not always the case. If you, in um, more orthogonal buildings, you can design the shape and make everything stiff enough that it keeps that shape, whereas these things which are uh, totally determined by the flexibility of the materials, how the, like how the fabric stretches, you can't just design a shape and expect it to work in fabric unless you integrate some of the physics in the design. Uh, so these are some grid shells. Um, Again, very much uh, inspired by the work of, of Chris Williams and also using many of the algorithms that he's developed. Um, and over time, expanding it to, to cover different things, so inflatable structures. And it really made me happy to see these kind of uh, applications where people are combining many different types of structures in novel and very playful ways. Um, or ten, uh, tensegrity structures. It's a nice pavilion. They're actually inflated uh, metal cushions. And uh, tensegrity, again, is something which is really, uh, you have to integrate the forces and the form when you design it. Otherwise, it won't, won't stand up at all. Uh, or another interest of mine is reciprocal structures. So in this case, this was uh, a little uh, pavilion project we built as a workshop. And uh, the constraint that I was optimizing for here, so this is moving away a little bit from op, uh, just simulating elasticity. And here the constraint we tried to solve was that uh, between these two blue lines, that red line is saying that uh, the shortest line between the two lines is always kept at a certain length. So that means you can always make sure that two cylinders are tangent. And uh, this workshop, we had very limited fabrication facilities, and what was nice, we just showed up with uh, hundreds of pre-cut plastic tubes. They were all one meter long, uh, a bunch of cable ties and measuring tape. So we had computers, and we used the computer to make a model and optimize it for these crossings, and then we just measured the distances, marked them, uh, assembled it with the cable ties to make a, a 3D structure. So this is, and tying into some of the stuff that Robert talked about this morning about uh, if we use uh, geometry and computation in the right way, it can actually make things simpler to build and be an advantage rather than just an indulgence. Um, I also worked a bit with a company called Robofold who were doing curved folding of sheet metal with robots. And there we, we used it to simulate the, the folding paths beforehand, which then uh, was used to program the path the robot would move through in order to fold these uh, stiff metal sheets. Um, and some, so some of these things, is, as I say, it's moving away from necessarily just designing by simulating uh, real-world behavior. Sometimes we can define particular constraints uh, just for the purposes of design um, or for the purposes of fabrication. So this, is, this really nice pavilion used the idea of planarization um, and this is the idea that you can use, uh, I call them pseudo-physical materials. So I define um, something that behaves within this physical system, and I can minimize energy in the same way I do for elastic behavior. But here, it's just that each panel tries to be flat and tries to be certain dimensions, which means you can fabricate it out of uh, flat sheet material, as they did here. Uh, so a few more pavilions based on these kinds of principles. Uh, this one, a very recent one, uh, very nice pavilion, built uh, in cardboard this time. Uh, and then over time, eventually this, a lot of it early on was student work, but it started to be applied on larger buildings. So this uh, Thornton Domicetti project, where they used this to actually optimize the, the glazing panels for this stadium. And then um, 
when I first joined Foster and Partners, this building, uh, although it's not a hugely complex form, it's for that, uh, that curved part along the front, it had been designed uh, in a way that all of the panels were doubly curved and then fabrication had already started and we needed to optimize to make sure that they could all be made flat. Um, another project involved um, some more catene reform findings. So this is the, uh, the project for uh, a new airport for Mexico City, which was a, a gigantic form found vault uh, to be built as a space frame. Uh, the project started construction. It's not actually happening now for reasons I won't go into now. Um, and finally, I'm going to end talking a bit about Crossrail Station. And here's, it's actually a very subtle uh, use of uh, dynamic relaxation here. Um, so it's not about the inflation of the pillows here. It's really about the distribution of the panels. Now, in this image, it's, uh, it's hopefully not obvious. But there's a region in the middle of that um, where the panels are all identical. Uh, but if you look at it from the side, you can see the front is actually inclined at a different angle to the rest of the panels. And here, there was an optimization used where all of the nodes of the structure were allowed to move in one axis, and it was all about easing that transition. So going from perfectly regular panels allowing repetition to meet this pre-designed curve of the, uh, the front end. And... Uh, trying a mix of different uh, energies in this system, so trying to keep the grid line straight, uh, keeping within the limits of the largest fabricable uh, ETFE pillow, and uh, finding a good balance between all of those things. Um, so that's, that's where I'm going to end now. I'll talk later in more depth about um, the algorithms used for this. And, um, but really, to conclude on that, it's just a, a very quick overview of the use of energy minimization in design. And I think uh, minimization methods, when they're integrated early on in the design process, they allow you to um, combine a lot of different factors and um, satisfy constraints. And it's an idea of actually putting these uh, constraints of rationality and also a way of finding aesthetic forms uh, all into to one system. So I'll end there, hopefully on time. Thank you.